in the trenches with Ryan Roxy. Hello, 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 hello. Ryan Roxy here and welcome to another live episode of In the Trenches with Ryan Roxy. I'm your host. How many times can I say the name Ryan Roxy? <laughs> well, guess what today? Today it's one of those episodes, folks, where I'm relaxed because we have family. We have family on the show. And, um, but at the same time, I did not uh, slack. I went, I did my uh, due, due diligence on our artist today because that's what we like to do here at In the Trenches podcast. We like to dive in deep and uh, see what the creative process, what motivates our artists, what drives them, um, what keeps them surviving in the trenches and getting out of the trenches and basically having very successful careers. Because today, guess folks, he's a, it's, it's a success story. The ultimate success story. I have an angle for it. He's the hero to every technician out there. I'm telling you, that's my angle. He's made that jump from technician to rock star back to technician, back to rock star. He's vacillated. Yes, folks, I said the word vacillate. He, between the two over the years, and to me, that is a huge success story. So will you please help me welcome to In the Trenches, Mr. Mike Fasano. Hello. Hey, what's happening? How you doing, buddy? I like to, I like to say I'm a 30-year overnight success story. That's <laughs> yeah. what I'm calling yeah. it. You hang around long enough, people start to notice you, right? Exactly. Wow. Well, everybody exactly. knows you, especially in the chat. And folks, if you're just arriving right now, uh, thank you very much for showing up to In the Trenches. Hit that subscribe button if this is your first time. And uh, obviously, our live chat is on uh, Facebook Live or YouTube Live. Make it on over to YouTube official Ryan Roxy. Hit that subscribe button. If you are watching it or listening to it on a platform such as Apple or Spotify or any of those, you'd want to come over here because you, you have to see just the coffee cup that Mike is working on today. He is the ultimate cat dad and um, he shaved for this. I, I was fooled because in the promo that was coming up for the, uh, for the show, yes. I thought that maybe you'd let it go scruffy, but you told me it was important. Ryan Roxy, you, it's not, I didn't just shave for this. This was, this is my version of a wardrobe change as we say in the business. <laughs> you know what I mean? You, are a guy fronting a band who can wardrobe change. I'm a guy sitting behind a drum kit who can't wardrobe change. Right. You know? Right. So anyway, well, you, so. you've played, I mean, I'm going to go into all the bands that you've played in because you've played such a spectrum of different styles of music. They've all been the music that you like and sort of were raised on, but they've all been different styles of rock because you are a rock drummer. I would say at the end of the day, yeah. you like rock music, but there's so many different genres that are included in rock that you've been involved in and just the bands that you've played in. And in fact, folks, for those of you that don't know, right there, we are uh, co-founding members of a band called Dad's Porno Mag. And that's where it sort of kicks off our friendship. But uh, like I said, we'll get into the other bands as well. You know, um, what's funny is I've played in a lot of bands, you know, but um, I can honestly say I'm a member and a founder of Dad's Porno Mag. And um, that, that means a lot to me. And playing in, in Dad's Porno Mag, you know, I, 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 was, I was told you were off air. I was listening when I woke up this morning, pre-gaming it, as you say, yeah. to our, our records. I've needle dropped our records before. Um, just uh, a song here, I want a song there, but I listened to everything all, all the way up until the show started. And um, man, it's like, I learned so much from playing with you and um, the music we made and how we made the music, the Dad's Porn and Mag stuff, AKA DPM, the Roxy 77 stuff, which I'm sure you'll get to. Um, I don't know, man, it, it was life-changing for me. The people I met around you, it's weird, I'm not, I'm not trying to be emotional, but you're such a, a big part of my musical career. Um, it professionally, you know, getting out of like, uh, getting off the cruise ships, getting, um, you know, which I played on cruise ships, you know, um, getting, getting out, um, and playing gigs. I mean, I remember, you know, we had a, a thing, we had a following and it was all because of you. Um, I know that we had butt heads, 
because I thought I knew everything and I thought I had to be a certain way, but, but, uh, but all of that stuff has shaped me to being a better person in a band. And I think uh, my, in my twenties and thirties, we grateful. all think we know everything in our twenties and thirties. I think we, yeah. everybody knows something. And I think I met you, you were in your late twenties. I was in my early thirties, somewhere around that. You know, yeah. I don't want to go. It's it, it, because everything gets a little bit hazy. But this band called Dad's Porno Act, we were America's band, folks. We were a, a power trio. Uh, Will Efforts, the original bass player of Dad's Porno Mag. We eventually became a four piece. Um, Will ended up uh, putting down the bass for a little while. Or, or I, I think, yeah, he put down the bass for a little while, then he came back. But um, that's when we got uh, Stefan Adika on bass and Carrie Kelly on guitar, who both have become very instrumental in our careers as well. But this is the thing I like about it, because we have a little section, uh, let's go back to get forward. And of course... You know, you say you pre-gamed it by listening to some Rock to Seven. I pre-gamed it by wearing what we w- would normally wear at a little rehearsal studio in a place that we like to call where Mike's hood was, Burbank. What well, was close to yeah. Burbank? But yeah. Mike is the sort of epitome of Burbank, California. But you know, we'd say, what would what was the thing we'd say? Something about why don't you why, why don't you come to Burbank? Yeah. <laughs> right. And then eventually we always. Burbank? Yeah, I think we should introduce the band from Burbank and stuff because it was just so not Hollywood. And yeah. but it, look at look what happens. It's become sort of the mecca of where so many things are. There's some more old pictures of Dad's Porno Mag, but I wanted to talk about before Dad's Porno Mag because you mentioned it briefly, folks. You started on drums. You built up uh, your chops on basically the Love Boat. And yes. I want, and then how, what do people not know about cruise ships? And they might not know anymore. I mean, the cruise ship sort of industry might be forever gone. It might be a faded memory now, but you grew up playing the cruise ships and you got your, you know, you basically in the trenches there. What was that whole experience? How did it start? And what was it like? Well, you know, it started, I worked at a music store and two of the teachers from the music store were going to be auditioning for a contractor to go to do a cruise, which I thought was going to be like a week or 10 days. And they said, why don't you go to this audition? Um, And I remember it was at the musicians union in Hollywood. And we went to this, to this, uh, to this rehearsal room. They had a couple of rehearsal rooms and we played um, Jimmy Buffett's Margaritaville, which is basically a rock song with a cross stick and it's soft and it's dynamic. And, um, and, uh, the contractor guy said, and this was sort of a thrown together thing. The contractor guy said, well, you can play with brushes, right? And, I was like, and me being, you know, 19. Oh yeah, of course I can. You know, and, uh, and sort of, uh, the first, the next thing I know I'm signing a contract and I didn't know what I was signing, but, um, the first cruise was from, uh, San Francisco all the way down through LA, through Mexico, through the Panama Canal to Florida. So it was like 10 days and it was a three month contract I signed. And so um, I was having to play cha-chas and waltzes and rumbas and Stevie Wonders. I just called to say, I love you. This is like 89 and uh, yeah. wear a tuxedo and the ladies dance ballroom and in sequin dresses. And, and it was just crazy. And I'd never left. I had never left home, never did anything. I was called this princess cruises university. This was my university. And, um, and it started and that, and that's sort of how, how it all started. Um, but I remember <laughs> I, on a, you were yeah. missing out of that shot. I see, you know, but was that basically the crew? And then of course, Oh my God, let me just tell you something. I met Merrill Steubing, Captain Merrill Steubing or Gavin McLeod, because he was on our ship. We were on a, on a ship and they were, they were christening it and it was a big fanfare and he was on and a few of the other people were on. I remember we were talking to him backstage because we had to play before they came on. And Captain Steubing, or, or uh, uh, his son, is in a band called the Butthole Surfers, and he was totally stoked about telling me that. And this is I like did God, not this know is thirty that. years I ago didn't... now. This is thirty oh, years wow. ago. So it was cool. So I got to hang with him like an idiot. You know, we didn't. You didn't have a camera on your cell phone and whatever. I didn't get a picture, and I, I don't have any pictures of really. Any I believe you. Rare. I believe that you yeah. and Captain Steubing got that uh, that moment to say hello to each other. Was he was he liquored up? Was he a little like, no, he was super pro and super cool. I think he's super Christian. Not that there's oh, anything, yeah. 
wrong or right or whatever. I know a lot of alcoholic Christians, trust me. Do you? (laughs) Yeah, I do. I think I might be one of them. I'm not sure. Born and raised. That was was my start. But but I I remember I had had just such an experience of being away from home, you know, um, living with other people, sort of like a dorm kind of thing, um, playing all kinds of different music. Um, I didn't know how to play any of that stuff. And there was a guy named Rich Watson and he was in the big band. He was from New York, big band, like we're like 12 piece big band. And I would go watch him. He took me under his wing. He showed me how to play brushes. He showed me how to play some bossa novas. I was a quick study and it was a quick learn to this stuff. And, but I, but I, but I thought I was Bobby Blotzer or Tommy Lee. I think there's pictures of me <laughs> on, on the ship sitting my stick in my tuxedo. The thing it is, your stupid. hairstyle now, your hairstyle now would have fit so much better in the cruise ship days, you right. know, than this hairstyle that you did have. Uh, Vic, do you have a picture of um, him on in the hairstyle days? No, you don't have that? My okay. Sweet, but it, in, we call it? <laughs> and Capizios? No, you man, you took it down on the sides. Did you even take it down a little bit for, for the show today? I love it. Oh, There's a yeah, nice shot you, of you. Listen, this is show business, baby. You taught me all about it. You got to look good when you're doing the show and this is the rock show man of a million haircuts and man of a million drum kits we have mike fazano on in the trenches folks thank you very much for tuning in if this is just your first time well you got to hit that subscribe button and of course uh get in the chat room get involved because that's what this is all about and of course there it is mike brought his own shot of him is that on a is that sort of the cruise ship days that's the cruise ship check out my puffy hair i actually had a mullet Look at the tuxedo. Oh, and for anybody who knows my folklore in the studio, that is Big Red right there. The Big Red snare drum, that's Big Red on November. It's still Big Red, the the snare drum. Okay, we're going to get into that. Uh, We're going to get into uh, the sort of angle of my show here today is how you have been that sort of ultimate success story of how someone can run a uh, studio drum business like you have for many years, but then make that crossover onto live performance. Cause you've been, you were performing live before you had the company and then yeah. you've been able to go back and forth. And we met, I would say probably around the same time that the band you're currently in formed, like right around the early nineties. Um, that's when we sort of got together and I, can you refresh it was like me? Like ninety four ish. It was at A and M Studios for the Gilby Clark record that Wadi Watel was producing. Matt Sorum was playing on it. That's when we met. We met because you came by the studio to you played on some stuff, but you were also around all the time. I mean, yeah. you know, when we were cutting the other drummers, there was a few Mark Dan's eyes in, Matt Sorum, Rob Afuso from Skid Row played. Um I even yeah. played on a track. We did a, a track, an Alice Cooper song. God, I can't think of it. I played. I, I played. He's a whore. I did. I definitely uh, played on. He's a whore in the studio. The cheap right. trick cover, which I don't know. They said it was going to come out on the uh, Pawn Shop Guitars record, but right. it, I don't think it did. It came out on a sort of Japanese album called Blues, a little EP, right. a little bit later. But the cool thing is, my name is right under Slash on the Perfect. actual Pawn Shop Guitar album. So perception being reality, there you go. And, and, and then of, of course terms. I toured. Yeah, perception is yeah. reality. But uh, I I definitely um, remember those days because I was playing in the Gilby Clark band. And then from there, and it, it's folks, it's the same thing that I, I always say is like, be cool to the band members that you're friends with now because they will lead you into your next gig or be associated with it in some way. And when Mike and I started jamming with Will, who was playing bass in the Gilby Clark band, well, who produced... Um, a lot of the uh, first demos that we were playing with, uh, whether it was the Unbelievable Truth or, or even before that and right around that time of the DPM, uh, there was a bunch of demos. It was Gilby Clark. So, yeah. And then, of course, uh, Jim Mitchell and Mark Shulman yeah. took us under their wing. And Mark Shulman, for, for those of you keeping score at home, is another incredible success story of a drummer who uh, plays currently with who? Pink. He's Pink. playing with Pink now. Go. Well, I mean, nobody's playing now because of COVID. But yeah, he's Pink's drummer. But he played in Foreigner. He played in Simple Minds. Um, he played in Billy Idol. 
He subbed yep. for Matt Sorum and Velvet uh, Revolver. Um, so Matt, between and, and Mark, Mark is an incredible human. Right. No doubt. Mark Shulman. Uh, and then we had Jim Mitchell, of course, that came under the, under the wing of the production wing. They were, uh, helping produce that first dad's porno mag record. And then, uh, we were managed by, uh, the ultimate Rick Canny Jr. There you Rick go. Rick Canny Jr. Jr. Who I, who I am, uh, friends with still today. And you know, what's crazy about Rick is Rick is following me on Instagram. We, uh, Tiger Army did a, a couple years ago, we did a couple of shows at the Ace Hotel Theater in, um, in downtown LA for a release of our um, Dark Paradise ED. It was something to put in between tours and, and records. And Rick reached out to me and he was like, oh my God, I can't believe this. You guys sold two nights out. This is crazy. I'm so proud of you. He's a manager. So he knows how hard it is to sell a venue out. He's never heard of Tiger Army. Tiger Army doesn't get radio play. There's no video MTV. There's you no get nothing the right the radio following. play, though. I want to talk about that because, honestly, remember remember back in the day when we were so psyched that we were going to get one dad's porno mag song played on K-Rock, and it ended up being for, I think, the uh, that – uh, contest that we did, but they ended up playing one song and we were all, oh, at least I was out of my mind excited that they were playing it. But at the end of the song, the DJ comes on the air and he goes, well, sometimes you got to play something that the man asked you to. And it wow. was basically like the, the somebody yeah. from the head off of his K rock. And I remember it was one of our biggest goals to be popular on K rock and that sort of scene. And it, just it's through the course of time, the way things happen, you are now in a band that are K rock darlings in a lot of ways. They support you guys. You guys they have a, a, a very good, uh, a very huge Los Angeles following. And the thing that I want to, you know, sort of emphasize is that whether it's the cruise ships or whether it's dad's porno mag or whether it's the band warrant that you played in uh, a multitude of years of, you yeah. know, you were peppered in there throughout seventh, the years. Ninth and, seventh, ninth, and 11th drummer. <laughs> well, there you go. And there's a nice shot of warrant right there where you guys all are apparently looking. Uh, somebody said, put your necks forward. What was it? Who, who's doing that? You know what? I, was, I had creepers on because I thought I was the punk rock guy and the, and the young guy and the old uh, washed up dinosaur band, hair band without the hair. And um, uh, it was Niels Lozauer who said, ah. lean forward, who took our picture. And lean you know what's forward. funny is our, our friend Bobby Bruner from Maid's Bus is my chops about it all the time. Because I lean was like forward and yeah, yeah, Lean forward yeah. and give him the uh, Zoolander. The, give him, give, give, lean God, <laughs> lean forward stuff. and give him Blue Steel. That was it. But you know, we, nah, don't be, man. Embrace it. Embrace it. Because honestly, that's my whole point about you being the success story. Uh, because Okay, you get off the cruise ships, you're playing with us, you start this drum company uh, that tell people what it is that you do, because I feel that it's one of those things that there's not a lot of people that are as specified and specialized and as qualified to do as you do it. I know there's a couple guys in Los Angeles yeah. that work the studios, but you yeah. built your whole company up around that. So what is it? To make a long story long, basically, um, uh, you know, Matt Storm encouraged me to get off the cruise cruise ships. He says, if you can't, if you, um, if you were on a cruise ship for three months, you can't audition for somebody in town. In LA, there was all the cattle call auditions for bands. And I had auditioned for um, Wilson Phillips, Foreigner, Terrence Trent Darby. When I did get off of that, um, I was also working at a music store called Valley Arts and I was living with Matt Storm when he was in the, in Guns N' Roses doing the Use Your Illusion tours. Basically, I was babysitting his girlfriend and <clears throat> uh, walking the dog and watering the lawn for my rent of the room in one of Duff's houses that we were renting. Um, uh, so you were for, you were the pool boy, the pool boy yes, to, yes. to Jerry Falwell Jr. as yes. what Matt Storm is. Well, no, no, never, <laughs> never that topical. way. But, <laughs> okay. That's he didn't funny, watch. but no. It, you know what I was? The, you know what? I was a sweet kid from, you know, Mama Fasano and, and Matt was like a big brother to me. So I was really watching out for his his best interest. Um, and it was weird because there was a, a neighbor. Uh, uh, there was a neighbor named Danny. He was a bass player in a band. Uh, 
and he would come and visit, and they would hot tub together. Sounds and, creepy and, already. And, and, and Lisa would bass tell me, we're and just Danny. friends. We're just, we're just friends. We're just friends. Now, the older Mike Pisano knows, well, we're not just friends. But, uh, <laughs> but anyway, so it was, a very, it was hard for me to turn the head and not say anything. But, um, but anyway, so living with Matt, uh, Matt, um, they came off the road. Uh, Matt had to do the, the finish the spaghetti incident record. Matt's drum tech for many years, Timmy Doyle, was in Texas with his wife. She was having a baby. They had to do a, um, a couple of days of uh, pre-production re- uh, rehearsals and then go and finish this this record. He said, please what was come. The record? You know was that the spaghetti stuff. incident? Or? Spaghetti, the spaghetti incident. So, okay. um, so basically... That's, this is Guns N' Roses, folks. This was just to kept you up on a couple of details. Matt is Matt Sorum from the, the drummer of the cult and uh, subsequently Guns N' Roses. And Guns N Roses and no, the Revol- Revolver, right? Of course. Now he's, of course. Right, whatever. Yeah. And the many things that he does, but human activists. So yes, he said, "Come and help me." Um, you know my setup, so and you know I worked at the music store. I had my hands on product. I knew what product did. I knew how to tune drums. The guys there taught me how to tune. Scott Mundy and one of our customers, Bruce Jacoby. So I had a good feel for it. So when I went in the studio, I tuned with him. Mike Clink liked it. Um, Matt said, "This is great. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna do sessions until Guns and Roses, until we go on the road again, and then Timmy will come back and tech for me." I said, "Great, whatever." At that time, I was working at the music store, making $160 a week. I was doing uh, these top 40 country weddings, bar mitzvah. Some were $30, some were $50, some were $150 gig. That would supplement my, my income. Um, I went in the studio. I made $150 a day, which is more money than I've ever made. And, um, you know, Mike Clink recommended me to Ron Nevison. Ron Nevison was doing a uh, Michael Shanker record. And I worked with him on that, and uh, and then um, I went from what that. What is to, your skill? Are you are you the oh, like, tuning, the, the tuning, horse? You're the drum whisperer. Drums. Yeah, well, you're the I, drum I'm whisperer. Drums. drums are weird because drums are weird because you can't plug them in like a guitar and look at like a strobe tuner or electric tuner, saying, "Oh, this is in tune." For some reason, I had some kind of knack. I, I, first of all, I love drums. To this day, I look. Somebody posts a picture. I look, I blow the picture, screenshot, I blow it up. What's he doing? What's that? What's that mount? I'm crazy about drums. Drums saved my life. Music saved my life. I came from a strict Italian upbringing, um, whatever. Music was my out. Was, music was my passion. Still is. Um, but, but I tuned drums and, I, and I, um, I had a knack. Mike Clink liked me because I could tune the drums versus a road guy who doesn't have to be so specific with the tuning per se. Not saying that there aren't great road guys that do that. I fell into this thing. We went from Guns N' Roses. A month later, we did Slash the Snake Pit record in the studio, and Matt was playing on it at the oh, time. Oh, again, at, at Sunset Sound, uh, right? Yeah. Or was this oh, at, at, actually at Conway? And then, okay. and then um, that's where I met Jerry Finn. Jerry Finn was the guy, an assistant engineer. He said to me, "Hey, I uh, I could hire a uh, drum tech for this Muffs record I'm doing with Rob Cavallo." who's Rob Cavallo. I like, I didn't know anything. It's like, are you available? Of course I'm available. I had nothing going on. By that time I quit my job at the music store and I'm looking to do these technique gigs. So Jerry and Rob had worked on Green Day. They had me come to the next, the Green Day record, which was six months later. So it was Green Day. It was Guns N' Roses to Green Day in six months. Met Trey Cool. We, we did this record. Um, and then the next record was coming. I found a couple vintage snare drums for him and I bought them for him. Management paid me back. Then Trey said to me when we worked on the next record, he said, you know, you should be buying these drums because if we come to town, we could rent these drums from you. If we need a piccolo for this record, we'll rent it from you. And I was like, whoa, like what a piccolo is like, snare real, drum. Yeah. a piccolo snare drum or a, or a not, not, or not the actual drum. sort of thing that they would yeah. use like in the revolution. No. Just so, you so clarify. <laughs> so in town, when you're recording, you want to have really great instruments and, and from vintage guitars to vintage drums or to, to rock drums, to rock guitars or rock amps. So there's a few companies that, are, that do that. So I started amassing a collection of, of uh, drums to rent as I was working on these records. But the bottom line is, I was always playing. I, I always had a band. I mean, many times we did morning rehearsals at 10 a.m. for a long that. time yeah, because yeah. I had to get to a session by noon and I worked all day. So, so yeah, so I created, um, I created my own business of, of renting drums, tuning drums on sessions. And that's my day job. That's been my day job for a, for a lot of years. Um, yeah. and, um, your day job turned in your day job. Let's be honest, folks. 
can turn into a very, very late night job because all the names that Mike just spouted off, like he just really just rapid firely, uh, rapid fired these names, but you got to take them into account. The names that he's mentioning folks, Rob Cavallo, uh, Jerry Finn, especially just, just Google the name. You'll see the albums behind it. Blink 182 records, the huge records, Green Day, the huge records, Mike Klink, you know, it doesn't get big, bigger than Appetite for Destruction. Um, so all these names that Mike's just sort of casually dropping are very important names in the history of rock and roll. And you're a part of that history too, Mike, because you are the drum whisperer. A lot of people only would use you because of what you brought to the table in the studio as far as the drum sound that they would get. A lot of people actually said that the Blink-182 drum sound was your sound. Well, you know, I was fortunate enough to work with Jerry Finn and Joe McGrath, who's a fantastic engineer, and Sean O'Dwyer. Um, and we worked with Sean at Conway when we, when we did the Freaks uh, on Freak or Tweak on Tweak song with Kerry Kelly um, at Conway. Um, we recorded the song that nobody knows about. I don't even know where, who has the recordings of it. But um, I was lucky. And, and to this day, I work with the best producers or I work with the best engineers. So, if I do something at the source and they capture it, they're only going to make it sound better. And also lucky enough to work with really great bands all the way from uh, Stevie Nicks to uh, Nine Inch Nails and everybody in between. I've been very, very fortunate. And if it wasn't for Mike Klink and Matt Sorum and then eventually Jerry Finn, which I did like a good 10 year run with Jerry, who was a cheerleader for me and brought me on sessions, I wouldn't have what I have today. You know what I mean? And, and I established, um, just at least a, um, what's the word I want to use? I have a, uh, oh God, I don't even know what I'm yeah. trying to say. I have a reputation, whether people like it or not, there's a reputation that I get something done in the studio for them. But being a drummer, that's the other thing too, is I understand how to play drums. I'm not just a guy dropping off drums and here's the drums and they worked for this band. So they should work for you and your completely different band. Um, I never did that. I always cherry picked. I always tried to really dive into what they were doing and really, always had an option. I listened to everybody and what they were saying. I listened to what the bass player was saying, the producer was saying, the singer was saying, everybody. My ears were just, I had big ears and wide eyes and I, and I always had an option for somebody to be efficient, get the best sound. And I was lucky because I was welcomed in and I was trusted. The funny thing about working with all these bands, these huge bands, like it's like, I remember I worked on a Marilyn Manson thing. I was one of Many, the three or four drum companies brought a bunch of drums into Conway one day for Marilyn Manson and they had, it was all kooky. It was uh, Michael Beinhorn producing. They, they blacked out the uh, control room. So it was pitch black and they had minor hats on. They had minor hats on. And this is like at like two in the afternoon, minor hats on. So it's dark and it's weird. And it's like right they're, out of the Marilyn Manson playbook, dude. Right out of the no, Marilyn exactly. Manson dressing like, room playbook. And I, and I looked at these guys and, and, and I was like, I, I didn't care. I was there for a reason. But this is how kind of like um, eccentric sessions are. I brought the drums down. I brought some toms and some kick drums. They tried them out. I think they took a kick drum and a set of the toms, the three toms that I brought. And, um, and then there was another kick drum. It was by a room mic. I moved it away and I was going to take it away. They didn't want to use it. And then Beinhorn's like, no, stop. That sounds great. So they rented one kick drum for me to lead by a room mic because it was resonating and it created a sound that was really cool for them. Oh, but, but I guess what I'm, but, but I guess what I'm saying is I didn't care if you were Maryland. Not, not, not disrespectfully. I didn't care. I was there to do a job. And very few sessions I've been really starstruck on. Um, and, and most recent was a U2 and a Metallica session that I did. Because those are two bands I thought I'd never, ever work with in the studio. And I did it were a Were you starstruck then? Were you, were you a little starstruck on the U2 or the, in the Metallica? Or no? Oh, oh, cool. it, yes. No, no. Yeah. Like I said, those are, those, are, those, are, those are a couple that I could say, oh, my God. These are, yeah. these are bands I, I, I had okay. no um, circle in. You know, like we have a circle of Gilby and Guns N' Roses and all this stuff. And then Green Days and all this stuff. So, so um, I was very, very fortunate, but, but I also was passionate and I wasn't, I wasn't, I just wanted to do, I wanted to, to do uh, if, as if I was playing and, and I was lucky enough to guys, I knew when to say something, if something was really wrong, I had three options. If they wanted something, I'd give them three options. And let me, it, let it me ask you that, that question. I, um, 
just so the people that are watching and listening at home, and if you are watching, uh, thank you very much for being on YouTube. Please subscribe as well and uh, Facebook Live. If you are listening, make it on over to the YouTube official at Ryan Roxy and hit that subscribe button. But thank you for listening because we are here with Mike Fuzano. Uh, obviously, we're talking about his business as a uh, studio drum technician, and in but also we're talking about the man himself and all the bands that he's played in and continue used to play into these days and so far we've gone through a little bit of dad's porno mag we've touched a little bit on warrant and we obviously folks will get to the tiger army saga in just a little bit but uh just a real quick uh defining just to give people perspective how many snare drums for your company at this point do you own and and because you're saying you're giving your uh, clients a lot of options like just out of how many snare drums could they pick from uh hypothetically well, I have 240-ish snare drums, and I have about 80, 80 <laughs> drum sets. Say? No, Dude. I know it's, I know, but but I know it sounds absolutely crazy. But here's the deal: I have this amazing collection. It, if basically there's the there's the um, what I call the usual suspects of of ten snare drums that I can bring on pretty much any session and have a vi 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 wide wide range of stuff. And in those ten snare drums. Some of those are triple. Like I have three Black Beauties. I have three Bell Brass. I have three um, Noble and Cooley. I have three Superphonics, Acrylite, these drums, these classic drums that always seem to work and always would ever get asked for. But then somebody might want a marching part or a vintage thing. And I have that vintage 28-inch uh, mahogany Ludwig bass drum that I can bring. And you could put it on, play it on a stand with mallets or you could put legs on it and you play it in the kit. Um, I have options for people. That's the whole thing. Um, and then drums, the drum sets, it's, it's a usual sub suspect. I made a name for myself with pork pie drums in the beginning of, of my, my career working in the studios. Um, and then big I champion realized- champion of pork pie. Always a big yes. champion of pork pie. Yeah. And then I realized the big studio kit in town everybody was using was Gretsch. So as I was getting new clients that were using other people that use Gretsch, I started buying Gretsch drums. And then um, I, I bought a couple of really great DW drums. Um, and then, um, I, I have a vintage Ludwig kit. I have a, a stainless steel kit. I have a, um, a Vista light kit, which is the clear plexiglass. I have all these sound options. Um, I have vintage Gretsch drums. I have new Gretsch drums. I have pork pie drums. I have a lot of stuff. Q drums. I, I have this thing. First of all, the, there are other companies that have way more stuff than this. And, 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 but the reality is if you want to get, a um, a a red sparkle Ludwig 1965 kit and a, or a green one or a this or that, that's great for color or look or whatever. That's for a movie. You can get that kit here. I, know, I have the drums that I know that I can contribute to a record and get a sound with and make something happen for, for, for like I said, from whoever you are. You know, if you're Fleetwood Mac or, or if you're, or if you're the, the doorknob band, the brand new band <laughs> that nobody knows about. I treat exactly the same. Well, you definitely have the drums that get heard on the records that people listen to. And that's, we can right. just leave it at that. So I get this whole part that you're working, it's your day job. It's a great, it's a great day job, yeah. night job. Um, but did you ever get any flack from the other uh, techs? Because you are playing in bands and you're making that switch, a lot of times I understand that crew, uh, you know, tech crews want to keep, there's a separation between yeah. them and tech crews. Now, luckily with the Alice Cooper band, there is uh, more of a synergy between that and there's a, there's a harmony. But there are some times that, that, you know, tech guys and band guys are separated and you're part of both camps. Did you ever get any shit or any sort of drama with that? Or have you always been the sort of hero? Never at all. Because I, I worked with guys like Adam Day and McBob and we, we had a little, we would jam uh, sound checks with guns and roses at the rehearsal studio or whatever, or that were the studio. No, I was always welcome to him because I was always like Matt Sorm's roommate when I came in and I started the fold. So I was always sort of accepted, but whenever I worked on a record, I was there to work on a record, not be a drummer. I was not to, to put, not, 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 not be a drummer, but not to say, oh, hey, this is my band. Check it out. Here's my tape. Here's my, my cassette tape. Here's my CD. I never said that. People that I got to have relationships with, bands, um, and, and, and it's organic. It's not every band, but the majority of bands I think I've become friends with and drummers, they would be interested in what I was doing. And they dug 
what I was doing. I remember Trey Cool asked me to go on the road after I worked with him in 94, 95. And I turned him down because I wanted to play drums. I was in dad's porno mag. And, and nobody turns Trey Cool down, but I did. And, and you know what, you know, his, and I could have been out. I could have been out of his world, but he, he put a spin on it and said, okay, he goes, that's cool. He goes, you're going to be playing drums. You're going to be not on tour with a band touring as a tech, and you're going to be working on records. So the next time we hire you to work with us, you're going to have that much more experience and you're going to be that much better. And you're going to have that many more snare drums and that many more options for my record. So he turned it around. It's a positive. So, I love um, it. well, I love, you know how much I love, you know, that I appreciate Trey cool so much because for one, uh, the three of us have golfed yeah. together and we've yeah. had some pretty good times of golfing. That's another thing, folks, that we have uh, very much in common, but haven't done nearly enough is that uh, Mike caught the golfing bug, I think a little bit after I moved to Sweden and then I was fully immersed into it, especially the last few years. But, the, you know, we we've definitely have the same golfing bug, but haven't done it nearly enough, but Trey cool went with us a couple times and we did enjoy ourselves. And he also came down and jammed with us that one time. Um, at, we played in a, I think on the pier, on the beach. Santa Monica. Yeah, somewhere in Santa Monica. He came in yeah. and he destroyed, he just destroyed like, like completely did like folks. He literally just almost destroyed the drum kit, but he destroyed, yeah. um, uh, I think it was step and stone when it goes, yeah. <laughs> and it goes yeah. into, well, am I right with that song? Yes. yes. Oh yeah, boy. We, we, um, I, I remember Green Day was doing a video for one of their things. And then after the video, we cut out and we had that gig. And then he came with me to, to Santa Monica on the pier. Was it Rusty's like surf ranch or something? Dude, that's a great memory. It was Rusty's surf ranch. Folks, don't Google it because it probably doesn't exist right now. It's right. probably per permanently out of business. But damn it. I think, it's, I think it's Bubba Gump Shrimp Company now, which is a corporate <laughs> thing. So, But yeah, he came and, and hung with us. And he was a huge supporter. And what's really funny, I woke up this morning and I saw... Um, I posted about the show again and he liked it at some point in the night. And, you know, it's like, it's cool to see that those guys are kind of keeping tabs on you or, or, or interested in what you're doing. And I'm, I'm, I'm family with those guys now. And, and, and they came to our wedding and, and by the way, going back to, why don't you come to Burbank? It worked for me because my wife, my beautiful wife came to Burbank and never left. No, so, that's um, right. you, live so you know, it's, it's not just cool. It's Trey cool. Um, the thing is, I want to move on a little bit because I am sort of keeping it folks on a, on a little bit of a schedule. I'm, we're, we're trying to tighten things up over here at in the trenches uh, podcast because Vic is uh, well, he's got a tiger shirt on <laughs> and, and folks, I really wish you could see it at one point. Maybe we'll bring it on. It might be the wrong merch for tiger army, it's, but it is a very, it's not, it's not even bootleg tiger army merch. It, it, it's so not, Vic, I think we're going to sort, we're going to send you a sort of care patch. Package I think Vic just went to a souvenir. Army. Yeah, he might have just gone to a souvenir shop at a local zoo, and that's what he got. But the thing is, I want to find out a little bit more about the evolution because you're you're playing in Dad's Porno Mag. At yeah. this point, we've expanded to a four piece. Stefan Adik is on bass guitar, and Carrie Kelly is on guitar. Now, this is that whole thing I talk about being cool to your band members because they will either lead you into the next band, or you'll probably have some association with it. Isn't it true that Carrie Kelly might have had something to do with your association with Warren, or did you have something to do with his association with Warren? Because at one point, you and Carrie are both playing in the 1980s uh, hair metal sensations, Warren. Well, well, what's no? It was it was probably it was um, I was found. Um, there's the lean in shot right there. Um, I wanted everybody to see. I wanted everybody to see the Japanese uh, dragon on my my sleeve. Uh, is that a serious to, clothing uh, shirt? Is that serious? Oh, clothing probably. Right Mag oh, uh, dude, how about Magnus is some crazy c car designer now? He's, from Magnus, he's, a, he's a mogul. He's a, he's a um, mogul no. mogul. You know how how Warrant came about was from Dad's porno mag. I started playing with Gilby. Mark Anzizen left the band. I started who's, playing who's in our play. chat, by the way, and yes. has, has actually uh, throw, thrown you a bunch of credit uh, because he said that the, the sound of the Gilby Clark album has 
Mike's stamp all over. You are responsible for that drum sound of the uh, Pawn Shop Guitars album. Plus, Mark Denzizen, just for those of you that would like to know, and I'd love to give the credit, he sang a lot of background vocals on all the records that we've made together, whether it's Roxy 77 or Dad's Porno Mag. Mike Denz Mark Denzizen's voice has always been a prevalent part of that. So so you were jamming with Gilby, and then what? How's, how does that switch uh, we, to? We were jamming with Gilby. We played at that club. Uh, it was the third anniversary in Las Vegas for a great club called Pinkies. Pinkies had all the rock bands come through and their side projects. So Janie Lane, I got, I, I, Janie Lane was there for this uh, third anniversary and Gilby Clark band was playing and I was playing with Gilby and uh, um, we played our, we did our sound check and then we, we did a cover and then Gil, we had Janie come up and do um, at soundcheck do uh, like a, a suffragette city or, or a Beatles song or whatever. I don't, I don't remember what it was. And we jammed with him. He came up on stage during our set because he was just doing acoustic things. So he came up and he was our special jam guest. We did a few songs. And it was sort of, to be honest with you, um, it was like, it was this cool little blend. So a couple of weeks later, I was back in LA and I got a, I got a call from, uh, from like um, Bobby Steinman saying, Janie wants to do an, like, a, like a, a band, like a cover band with guys from Rat, guys from Warrant. You can be the drummer from, from Gilby using that name. It's all, it was always about associating a name. And I was like, wow, that's crazy. Uh, I couldn't believe that he remembered me. He invited me to Warrant show at the Roxy and whatever. So I, he goes, Abby, do you want to do it? I was like, do I want to do it? Of course I want to do it. So we did this thing. And it, you know what? I want to say it was the pre, at least in LA, from what I know, it was sort of the first of the kind of all-star bands. Not that I was an all-star, but band guys going together and doing covers. What became the star effers at the Cat Club, what became yeah. Camp Freddy um, right. or, or uh, Kings of Chaos and all of this stuff. We, we, but it was Janie Lane doing it because he loved to play all these other songs. So we had Robbie Crane on bass. We had Danny Wagner, who was at the time the drummer of Warrant. Um, uh, we had um, Carrie Kelly on guitar and we would do these clubs and we did the little run, the run, it would be San Diego, um, uh, Phoenix, um, Vegas, and then back Mason home to LA. Yes, like that. it was, it was, it was those things. And, and we'd all make a few hundred bucks a show or whatever. It was just a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. One day, one day, um, Janie said, uh, it was January 1st. He said, we just played our, our gig and Danny quit the band Warren. We have a couple, we have like five or six gigs in a week. I told the guys in the band about you, learn these songs. You're going to do these gigs, but I'll be honest with you and Warren, they're going to do a cattle call and get some kid that's skinny with long blonde hair, pay him nothing to go on the road with Warren. And I said, great. Did the five gigs. Um, the next thing I know, a week later, there's a message on my machine from Eric Turner saying, hey, we have a photo shoot. Are you available Tuesday at two o'clock to do a photo shoot? And I called the manager, obviously, a photo shoot for Warren. I said, I thought you guys were going to get a kid with long, skinny, blonde hair to be the drummer. No, they love you. You're, they want you to do these, to be in the band, do the photo shoot. So that was the start with Warren. And there, you know there, I mean? and there was the sort of plant, seed, seed planted for the lean your face in closer to the camera photo shoot. Exactly. Um, Janie knew Carrie Kelly from, from all of us, from what we were doing. He knew about Dad's Born Mag. He knew what was happening you know, with, you know, he had a thing and, and Carrie at the time was in Big Bang Babies and whatever. Yeah. So Carrie did the first um, run with us. Then he got the gig with Rat playing guitar. We got Billy yep. Morris from Cleveland, who's in that, was in that picture on the right. And then that was the band. I was in the, in and out of the band for 10 years until Janie died. And, um, and that was sort of the, the thing. And in that in and out of, of time in 2004, I had, um, I had drum tech on a couple of Tiger Army records. Um, that was my, my start into Tiger Army. Um, uh, the drummer, um, Fred Hell, was shot <clears throat> in a robbery gone bad. And, yeah, it's like a uh, home invasion. That's that's yes. how it, it ended up happening. And he couldn't play the drums for the video. So, okay, I, I do want to get into this because, okay. folks, you... we, are now, we, we are now sort of venturing on. We're here with Mike Fasano, um, a drummer, multifaceted drummer, uh, big spectrum of bands, obviously Dad's Porno Mag, Warrant. And now we're moving on to a band that uh, perhaps it, you wouldn't think is in Mike 
Fasano's wheelhouse, but it fits in perfectly, folks. Look at him. He is 100% Tiger Army, and I believe Psychobilly is the name of the genre of music that it's uh, sort of clarified as, but you get into this band, the only standing member of the band, because it's it's gone through its members throughout the years, is Nick 13. And I yes. just wanted you to know that there's only basically one or two others that have been in it longer. So you are almost the Bruce Kulick of Tiger Army, just so you know. Well, thank you. <laughs> you I always got to be the Bruce Kulick. Bruce is a great guy. <laughs> and there you go. And there you have it. But it's an American Psycho Billy band. Uh, they are from the uh, Northern California area, originally formed, and then migrated down to Southern California. Jerry Finn, who you talk, who you spoke of before, who you had this relationship with your drum company, uh, yep. working in and out of the studios, who actually produced a track of Dad's Porno Mag, yes. uh, the, of, of a Carrie Kelly song called Tweaked, that I don't think anyone's ever heard. In fact, if anybody in the chat can go find that. Vic, can you play a little clip of Tweaked right now? Can you put... Did he, All right, slow, folks. did he slow it down so we it doesn't get recognized by YouTube so we don't get a strike? No, no, trust me. There will not be any copyright infringement. I think everybody owns that song. That was not the song that we uh, produced with right. Jerry Finn, though. But that was the video. It was one of the only videos that we made with Dad's Porno Mag, and that was the original lineup. That was Mike Fasano, Will Efforts on bass, and myself, and the Love Van. And uh, that video itself for a song called Big Fat Song, you can find it on YouTube. You can find it. Here's a little shameless plug right on the uh, Ryan Roxy official YouTube channel. If you just hit that subscribe button, you can go check it out after the podcast. But uh, yeah, that, that was a kind of a cool video. I was going to ask yeah. you, did you did you ever make any videos with Warrant? No. And you know what's really funny about that is there's not even a lot of live footage. Even over that 10-year span, I think there's a Hampton Beach, New Hampshire show, show in 2000 when I first got the band. That's up. It's okay. full clips. And then there's a few things. I mean, I think when Jan Janie passed away, a few more things came up, but there's not a lot of stuff. Just as there's not a lot of stuff of us um, playing uh, when we were playing yeah. clips. And when I was in Tiger Army in 2004, there's not, there's, there's nothing. My, my wife actually has a little clip from the side stage because we met on the warp tour together and she had clipped uh, a little clip, but there's not a lot of stuff, which is crazy where, where everything is filmed now. And there's yeah, so I much content it. everywhere. Well, the point was we do we do have a dad's porto mag video that will always live in infamy or, or or fame because we have a special cameo. It's cameo being the key word. Look at that <laughs> by Matt by Matt Sorum. Who's so if you watch the video, there is a little bit of a right. you know Matt being your sort of house guest as well, and yeah. uh, it was filmed up at Matt's mansion at mansion at that time. So I know we're and, jumping and he around lived a little next bit. He lived next to Madonna. She was the next house over. He would walk to his property try, oh. trying to catch eyes with her, but she'd never go out to that portion of her property. A lot of firsts happened with Mike and I at uh, Matt Sorum parties. And I don't know if we could talk about them here on In the Trenches, but a lot of first things happened. Um, laundry rooms. And the, I remember Matt used to have an amazing uh, house out in Malibu. We that we would go to parties out there. Sometimes it would start on a Friday and on a Sunday. <laughs> Folks, it really was boogie yeah. nights come to life. <laughs> and then uh, then he had a, that party up in the hall. Then he had that house up in the Hollywood yeah. Hills where he would have a, a lot of parties. But I do digress. I want to go back because when you first joined Tiger Army, yes, it was for a, a, a short window. But during yeah. that window, you were on the Warped Tour, and you got yeah. asked to be on the Warped Tour. And so how did it come and go, and what happened in, in that little window? To, to You obviously did something right that you would get asked back. Right. Well, yes, I'm so fortunate for that. But well, what happened was, is in Warrant, um, I had met this girl named Sally from Dallas. Her name's not really Sally, but we're just going to call her Sally from Dallas. And um, she was waiting for Janie Lane for hours, like three hours uh, in the front lounge of the bus while Janie was entertaining friends in the back lounge. And um, she had to go 
have her dog, had to let her dog out to pee. And then I went with her to her house. We, we hung out, we talked. She was really, you know, cool at the time, I thought. And, um, and then the next, we were back uh, in Texas a, a week later in Houston. We were in Dallas to Houston and she came to the show and um, I had told Jade, hey, this girl's waiting for you. And he goes, yeah, I know, I know, I know, whatever. And I go, well, hey, I'm going to kind of go to her house and, and whatever. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. Well, apparently it wasn't cool because when, <laughs> when, when she came, when she came to, um, came to Houston, Janie said something on stage, God love him. Like, Oh, look at Mr. Prim and proper behind the drums, Mike Fasano, you know, uh, blah, blah, blah. Meaning I was, uh, minding my P's and Q's and not being a rock pig. So, um, um, and, um, so and this led I thought, to I the to myself, of warrant. This, le this, this led to, this, this is led the first, to getting... this is the seventh firing. This is me okay. at number seven, seventh got... drummer getting fired. So he wasn't was into it. So basically, we more, I'm sorry, we're talking over each other right now. I'm really sorry because that is the delay, folks, and we could yeah. do this all day like that. But ousted from warrant, but uh, but then but then you somehow make it into uh, Tiger Army that same year. Yes. Because at that time, I had played on the Ghost Tigers Rise record. That's when Fred was shot. We played it. They were going on this. I got, I got fired because it obviously wasn't cool that I dated this girl. I ended up dating this girl for a couple of years, which was, um, which was you know, a, a, a very great learning experience. Um, Wait, but is um, this the girl but, that, that that Janie Lane was talking about just now? Yes, that girl from yes, Texas. Yeah. Shit. Yes. So the whole story all Sally, makes sense. Sally from Dallas. Yeah. Sally from Dallas, but her name's not really Sally because it's going to yeah. eventually be a Quentin Tarantino film. I love yeah. the fucking God. I, I'm sorry. I, I thought this is the story had nowhere, but I, it was going twists and turns. How no, Warren so he, and Tiger Army intertwined. It. He fired me. Um, so at that time, I was fired. The bass player from uh, from Tiger Army, Jeff Kresge, said to me, "He's we be he lived in Burbank. We'd meet for coffee, and he and he just said to me, hey, what are you doing? What's going on?'" I said, "Well, there's no really set. There's not. There's no sessions booked." For the for the business, people were touring. Um, I said I I got fired from Warrant, and um, and I've got nothing going. He goes he goes. Do you want to go on tour with us next week? And I go, why? What happened? He goes, well, Fred got shot. He's still not recovered after we did the record six months ago. He's we we, we did a couple things. He's still not one hundred percent there. So I went to see them play at the L A. Two sold out House of Blues shows. And I said, well, maybe we can get him on a click. I tried so hard to keep Fred in the band. And I think they were just done with it and they had to do this tour. And the world tour is grueling. It's, it's 28 shows in 30 days. It's, it's grueling. So you I never know when you're going to go on on a warp tour, right? Don't they? they right. They you, come one o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever. So, um, so I did the tour. Um, I was fired from Warrant. Um, and, you know, the, at the time I wasn't, um, I, you know, Warren was a party, right? You, you know what a party is on the road. And Tiger Army wasn't. Nick was very serious about his music. Mick ha Nick had a, uh, a, a, a style, a direction, and um, a message. And it wasn't about, oh, cherry pie. It was serious. He had serious content. And you know what? At the time, I just didn't get it. And I told him, you know, just a couple years ago, you know, I'm so glad I, and I left and I went back to Warrant. They hired me back. Um, and that, that seventh, and that would be the ninth portion of Warrant, of being the drummer. Um, and they probably had 21 drummers now. But um, that's the terrible thing. The drummer's the first guy always to go for whatever reason. But, um, but um, I, I, I just said, Nick, I've got to go back to Warrant. That's my thing. And, 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 you know, I'm sure he wasn't happy about it, but I, I, I said it to him. We talked like men. And that's Nick's the type of guy, mean what you say, say what you mean. And um, you know, fast forward, um, fast forward years later, he asked me to do two shows and two shows in 2015 turns out I'm still in the band. Um, but the yeah. other thing about Nick going back to Nick, when, um, when he, when Fred wasn't cutting it in the studio and they were three days into this ghost Tigers rise record after I had tuned drums and I got the call at midnight to play the next day, I said, well, I could probably do the rock stuff, but I'm not sure about the psychobilly stuff and the psychobilly for anybody who doesn't know it is if anybody knows the stray cat, we're a prunk rock version of the Stray Cats. And now Psychobilly is just one little slice of the pie with, with, um, with um, Tiger Army. It's very vast. There's, there's, there's country influences. There's swing influences. There's Latin influences. 
And be, with all of that being said, I remember when I was on the cruise ships and I had gotten off the cruise ships, Matt said, get off the cruise ships. I, I played in a band, uh, this Karen Fields band. And my friend David Hunter at the time, roommate, said to me, said to Karen, oh, this Mike just got off a cruise ship. So when I got off the cruise ship and I was playing with Karen, even though I wanted to be Bobby Blotzer from Rat or Tommy Lee. Um, You've gone he, into name drop overload. No, no, no. No, no, I, but, I but, 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 <laughs> no but I was a rock guy. And so, right. and, but she looked at me as not being rock enough. Now, with that being fast forward, Nick heard me checking the drums. He saw that I had a, a, a ghost note in my, my left hand. He saw that I could, had a swing to my playing. That's why when they asked me to do the record, I was like, maybe I can play the rock stuff, but I don't know about the psychic ability stuff. I ended up doing the whole record. And um, he saw something in my playing. Karen Fields thought, oh, you're just a, a cruise ship jazz drummer. I, you're not, Nick said, you've got swing, you've got whatever. To this day, if it wasn't for Nick 13 and his brilliance in music style, stylings, because he loves all the old stuff, um, I have a gig. And all of that cruise ship stuff that is, is funny oh, yeah. is, is people, yes, got me to where I'm at today. So, I, love it. I mean, just to, just to kind of circle back Dude. and. That put a, put is the, on it. that is sort of the evolution of your performance. And the whole time, folks, you have to realize that Mike Pisanos has his own studio drum business that he's working every single day because the, the work ethic that it takes to there, you have to work around their schedules in the business and then you do your rock shows at night. But now, fortunately, because of your position in Tiger Army, uh, you've had a lot more time to play the music, go on the tours. I was able to see Mike Fasano and Tiger Army play in Stockholm just a few short years ago. That was a blast as well. But it's so uh, great to yeah. see you and, and meet Bianca. <laughs> I love it. Well, there it is, Fanzano. Well, apparently you have a lot of nicknames, but that again, that's another story because we are moving on to a section called Let the People Speak. Because you know what, folks? I've been speaking. Mike Fasano has definitely been speaking, <laughs> and he's been dropping those names, folks. We're with Cat Dad Mike Fasano. It's time for our segment, Let the People Speak. And what Holy crap. Oh my God. I didn't even know that was going to happen. Vic has once again surprised these put the podcast world upside down with his production skills. Vic Chalfant and our Let the People Speak segment. Um, our first question comes from at Jackie.Kawe2. Who is your favorite drummer? This is where we get the folks in the chat who have been very, very loyal and having their own sort of conversations back and forth the whole entire episode. We get them. We compile their questions. They ask them to you. And Mike, can you please tell us who is your favorite drummer? You never could have a favorite drummer as you could never have a favorite guitar player. The first concert I ever saw was the Police Picnic 1983 in Toronto, Canada, when uh, when I when I first took a plane ride, first took a vacation with my mom, she was divorcing my dad, and I saw the police pick, and I saw Stuart Copeland. The only thing I knew was every breath you take. My Canadian cousins, Laura, was uh, the one who turned me on to the whole back catalog before we we stayed an extra week to see this concert. I knew all the songs. We were on the railing. We were there. It was a whole seven band show. The police came on, and I said, "Oh my God!" I I, I played drums. I played drums in the St. Robert Bellarmine uh, flag salute band. High school, we didn't have a, a, a band program, but I was in a band. Um, uh, I had obviously hadn't played on cruise ships yet or whatever, but um, I said, I've got to do this. I've got to play drums. I would say Stuart Copeland, uh, even though I played nothing like him. I love a guy named Russ Kunkel who played on um, a ton of stuff in the 70s and 80s. I love Mickey Curry who played on um, uh, the Hall and Oates and uh, he played on the cult record Sonic Temple and Ceremony. Um, I love, um, I love, uh, Louis Belson, who is a, a, an old, uh, uh, big band drummer and, um, gosh, uh, Matt Sorum, the big brother I've always wanted, but never had. He was such an inspiration to me. Um, just living with him and taking me under his wing and, and, um, you know, those, those are, I guess my, my five guys that, that I would, uh, I would just off the cup and, and they're not the usual guys. A lot of people say, Oh, John Bonham and. And uh, yep. whoever, and and you know, I missed Bonham, and I and I love Blotzer, um, and but always oh, you know, David Grohl, John Bonham, Tommy Lee, yeah, and, no, you yeah, know, so, 
I, I get it. I get it. But in, in that same sense that the guitar part, the guys that I like, guys like Neil Giraldo might not yeah. get mentioned all the time. Yeah. Elliot Easton from the Cars, sure. you know, but Steve Stevens. I know he he gets mentioned a lot, but maybe not in the, in those sort of page, you know, and uh, sort of slash mentions. But honestly, sure. these guys write such great parts. Not that everyone doesn't uh, put in their uh, deserve to have that that sort of house. If you're a household name, folks, you're a household name. And I'm speaking with household name, future household name, Mike Fazano right now. We're ready to our, another question of let the people speak. Uh, this comes from at mcar94. Your favorite song that you have been part of of a recording session. Now, this can include, I guess this can include you being the drum whisperer that you are. Um, are there, is there a favorite song or that you, a memorable song? Because I know that you actually have done some sessions with some pretty heavy cats. I mean. Okay. I think I, there's a couple of things. Um, when I worked with Green Day on Insomniac, there was a song called Brain Stew Jaded. And the first half of the song is doo doo. Doo doo that Trey played real slow. Doo doo, kind of a Zeppelin -y vibe. Yeah, doo doo, doo -doo. Right? And, and then it and then it kicks into that dude, do that, do that, do that, that, which is his wheelhouse. Trey had such a hard time playing doo doo slow. You know what I mean? This because they were they were punk and fast up to this this song uh, with the other couple records. And I remember he did about four takes, and they did it to tape. And they um he said he goes he goes I'm just just edit it. They edited this track together and it's a great song because it goes from this heavy, slow thing at Ocean Way in this beautiful room where you guys did Slash the Snake Bit, where we did Slash the Snake Bit eventually with Jack Douglas um, to uh, this fast punk rock song, and um, which is his, his wheelhouse, which he nailed. But um, they clipped this, these, these tape pieces, the best of four takes together. And I think when it came out and it was mixed and mastered, I think Trey heard himself being able to play this really slow groove. And I remember go, going to see the concert and they played like the Home Depot Center, the soccer thing out in like Long Beach or Lawndale or something, seeing him. And I was at the soundboard and he pulled that tempo so far back in this massive soccer uh, stadium. And I was just like, man, he's got it. He heard himself, how he could play slow. And he really became better. Green Day also did the transition where they started to slow down and write different songs. They weren't as angry about um, stuff and, and uh, whatever. So if you listen to American Idiot, um, there's a lot of slower stuff. There's a, it's like a rock opera. But anyways, he did the song. It was amazing. But one of my favorite songs I ever played on with you was on Roxy 77, um, Atom Bombs and Second Chances. And I believe it's just called Second Chances. And there's yes. another slow yep. ballad. And one of the best bridges to the solo musically and lyrically ever written was well, by you, you and i listen to that song for inspiration all the time that's one i listen to all the time one of the greatest songs and i encourage all of our listeners or watchers find the dad's porno mag stuff find the um find the roxy 77 stuff it's really great stuff we did a lot of really great stuff back then and you're still doing great stuff anyways there you go yeah I, I, how right old is that kid on our uh first album dad's porno mag not that kid carrie kelly and not that kid the idiot with the braids but uh the other one that uh, we were just showing the uh dad's porno mag album there that first one uh, was, was, wade, that, was that wade that was that was gilby's yeah. cousin i believe and that room right there folks if you can just hold on that nope you can't hold on that um <laughs> Um, the thing is that, uh, that, that actual concept of that album cover that was shot at Rick Reinholdson, who produced the one and only dad's porno mag video that we did big fat song. That was Rick Reinholdson's room when we lived in Los yeah. Angeles. So there you go. Cool. And if you can see all those things in, if you look very closely, you can see there's a Frampton comes alive album. There's a Boston album. There's a journey album. He's looking at a playboy magazine, folks. It's two 2020. Uh, nobody even knows what playboy magazine is anymore. There's a skateboard there, which is now skater boy country. Again, he's wearing a Raiders cap. There's a poster of Heather Friggin Thomas and Farrah Fawcett in it. I love it. This album cover. I, we got to get back to it at one point, folks. But there you go. Um, Wait, can I say one thing? This record was so great that we released it twice um, with two different covers. <laughs> yes, we did. Well, hey, man, 
We were on we were on Wax Tone Records at the first album. We that was Wax Tone, and I think you're on another Tone Records. You've you've had a uh, I think your current label is, is Playtone or some some no it's Tone Luna Records. Tone. Luna Tone. All right, there it is. Your your um, very favorite to the Tone Records. Um, one more question here from Alex Petrini at Alex Petrini. Your biggest fear? What is it? Every night going on stage. Um, yeah, especially with Tiger, stuff? yeah, with Tiger, yeah, with Tiger Army, especially because, you know, um, he reads the crowd, he reads the show, tempos push, they pull, um, and you can't, you know, we're hired, you know, uh, we're in his band, George A, the bass player, uh, George A. Stupovic, and I are are the ones to be the foundation and and follow his move and his his thing, and um, so it's yeah, I mean, every night I have a I have a uh, uh, ritual superstition. I, I, you know, start warming up at a certain time. I put my shirt on at a certain time. I, I put my deodorant on a certain time, I put my guy liner at a certain time. You know, I mean, I do a certain amount of things. I get in the zone because, um, every night I got to deliver. I don't, you know, especially, especially coming from, um, working behind the scenes and, you know, tuning and, and having a business and like that. I just, I just want people to go, I've always kept the tuning and the business part and the drum rental thing separate than the playing. And now in my, my older years, I, I don't you know really care anymore because I had lost gigs because people would say, Oh, you're just a drum tech and you're not a drummer and then uh, whatever. So I just don't want people to go, man, that guy sucked. And I, and I, of course, and I don't want to be the greatest drummer in the world. I just want to be the best drummer I can be in tiger army and whoever I'm playing with, but really tiger army is the, the main thing. Um, that that I I I love and am so grateful. Let me ask you this: is it, is it is it harder or just different to play with a uh, electric bass player that plays an electric bass or a stand up bass player as a drummer? Because we all know that drummers and bass players have that sort of locked in feel. They have to. They are the rhythm section. They are sort of the concrete. A foundation of any song it, how different is it to play with a stand-up bass player or a regular electric bass player that's a great question um it is very difficult i remember when i got called to do the gross Tigers rise record jeff kresky at the time had um you know there's a there's a the slap of the string there's the low end of of the the just the notes of a bass and then there's that, like a mid thing and there's a blend and i remember when we were going through these the songs, I had to actually have the the um, engineer turn the slap down because it was throwing me off. And and you know it's really funny. Speaking of the Stray Cats and Slim Jim, and I told them this once when I was talking to him, I always thought the clackety clack of the groove was him playing on like the rim of the snare drum or the tom, but it wasn't. It was the slap of the bass string in that because basically what psycho billy is is like punk a punk rock a billy is what psycho billy yeah. is to me that's how i explain it to my demographic of people um and uh so i had to have that turned out so i can just hear the root note so i could lock in with that and then everything on top and all of that movement is from the slap of, of the bass so it is difficult but i learned quick and then now playing with george a we've we've been playing together for five years now that guy is just phenomenal. And sometimes, you know, we're on stage and we don't have our own monitor guys. So we're, we rely on um, whatever the house monitor guy is. And sometimes I get great monitors of him and he plays some shit that is so crazy. I just, I start laughing because I'm scared. It's crazy. And I, and, and, and I, and it's like, I, I, I look at like some of the clips and the videos and I'm just going, man, that's amazing. I can't believe I'm behind that guy and that guy, Nick 13 doing this. I don't know how we do it, but we do it. It's absolutely crazy, and we're we're a great unit, and it, I love this. It's, this lineup it's cool this. that you have uh, you have both uh, experiences to work off of. Again, yeah. you know, we're playing with upright drummers or upright bass players, uh, standard bass players, and maybe it has a little bit to do with playing with rock guys like me or doing those cruise ships that we did earlier. So now, here comes a question from at Federock, uh, Federock and Roll Seven uh, Seven. Which is the musical collaboration that's enriched you the most? And you, this can be like a all the bands and uh, sort of collaborations that you've done, the, it could be the, uh, whoops, there's my fingers over here. It could be the, the um, cruise ships, Dad's Porno Mag, Warrant, Tiger Army. Is it 
one particular one that stands out for you or is it just a combination of everything that's been on your drumming journey? You know what? I'm going to, it's simple. You, Ryan, and Dad's Porno Mag, Mag changed my life because I got to, to um, play um, music. Like he turned me on to great music. Like we would do uh, covers that I'd never heard of, like Steeler's Wheels. Um, uh, we would do Allison. Uh, we would do stuff. Then we were doing our music, which was Cheap Trick. And to be honest with you, the only Cheap Trick at the time I knew was I Want You to Want Me. And, um, and we were very Cheap, cheap Trick po power pop influenced at that time. But I'm going to say you. I'm going to say Dad's Pornomag. But the elements of the cruise ship early on got me to where I am today with Tiger Army because Nick saw the value in the swing and the cha-chas and the rumbas and, and all of that stuff's on, the, on our new record that's out now that's called Retro Future. And it, it, but, but I put a rock element to it. It's not this wimpy light thing. There's still that rock foundation of, 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 of it. Um, so Retro Future, is that, when did that come out and uh, how much? Go ahead. September 2019, we toured um, the States. We uh, toured Europe. Uh, we went to Mexico. And then we were going to start a tour in March as COVID-19 stopped everything. So right. um, it's a really cool record um, if, you, if you guys have the time to definitely listen check to. it out definitely check out mike visano and uh the tiger army's newest uh, record of course um <laughs> there's one question that we have to get to from our last question let the people speak it's the one that we the mystery that we've all been waiting to find out this one comes from ed mike usnick of course from pink sock podcast fame how did the name the sack come about or do i even want to know and before we get into this question uh, or or maybe open this can of worms just know that we've always been into Mike and I uh, a bit of we've always had some playful names with, for each other or just or, or types of things that we would say sayings like there was a time when we were in dad's porn mad that we came up with uh, I eat Disney and I have no reason reason why I eat Disney became the, the sort of sort of uh, phrase that we would say but we would say it almost all the time. Right. Do you know why it happened? We were rehearsing at North in North Hollywood, at Andre Arango's studio, and there was we. I had the big. Uh, you had. I had the big Cadillac. You had the van. I you had pulled up that Cadillac. Yeah. Yes. Okay. You, you had the Cadillac. I had the Cadillac. We pulled. Did we do a rehearsal. photo shoot? We did a photo we shoot did. on the Cadillac. Is, is, did. Did, Mick, Mick, can you bring that photo shoot up? Uh, no, no. You look at him shaking his head. You know, you have that photo shoot. Come on, right. man. And do you remember one of the guys in the neighborhood, um, some black, funky gentleman who lived in the neighborhood, saw you pull up, and you probably had a fur on and your big shades, <laughs> and he went to you, I ain't Disney. Yeah. <laughs> and so it just stuck. It just stuck. Uh, well, that stuck. And then the other term, Mark, for some reason, I, we would I would call you Mark. Now, how did that well, come about? Was it Mark Van Zyzen? He wanted me to, be, me to be more like Mark Van Zyzen. So Aww. you'd call me Mark, you'd, you'd lengthen it. <laughs> but uh, our friend Mark, who is a super talented drummer, super talented uh, singer. Songwriter. Talented oh, an artist too. He would do our logo heads too, our DPM Producer. logo heads. Shit, yeah, Mark, so anyway. Mark is your one stop stop one stop shop for yeah. everything that's talent, man. I love it. Well, there it is. You know what? And and apparently the family even makes chocolate milk. The Dan Zeisen Dairy Farm has a new <laughs> Alice Cooper chocolate milk. Go really? endorse it right now. There it is. So it gets us to our main event, which is Mike Musnick wants to know, how did the name The Sack come about? I'm going to show you. Give me a sec. Oh, no, 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 no. Do not show me. No, no. I know the reason why. You don't have to show me, folks. Because I, I carry Close this big eyes. thing around with me. Okay, Check hold it out. On. Let's, let's go back. Let's see. Ah, yep. uh, see? How it's you a like sack. That? It's a, it's a backpack. That's all it was, PG folks. 13. Nothing to see Nothing here. <laughs> Everything is in there. Uh, you all know, right. Mike, Mike, I'll tell you what. If if I ever uh, pop onto your show, I'll tell you about it. I think Pink Sock Podcast is uh, more appropriate than – It is a more for, appropriate for the, podcast. The real answer. And if you get a couple yeah. beers in me, it'll, it'll be a good story. And honestly, I can tell you this. 
you can get a couple beers or maybe a couple Coke cans. And um, <laughs> it, it, it was one of our it was one of our backstage passes. We used to have yes. a laminate. Oh, our oh very first God. dad's protomag laminate oh was um, a Coke can. And um, we'll just say Mike. It was a Pepsi can. Uh, was it if Pepsi? anybody's looking for it, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it was a Pepsi you can. Remember and the brand. I remember, I don't know what tour we were on. I don't know if we were opening up for one of Matt Sorum's bands or if it was. I think was it, it was the, Snake. Was the yeah. Because my mom came to Vegas when we played the joint. And they all had our, my mom had that laminate around her neck <laughs> and never realized what it was. And, and all she said to me was, all she said to me was, you guys played. And it was, I was on the table and my drink was, but a boom, but a boom, but a boom. And my drink was moving from my table, but she never realized what she had around her neck. And folks, we will leave the sack of history better left unsolved. <laughs> <laughs> so folks let's move on we you know what your your gear we talked about it real uh earlier but i want to real briefly give shout outs to your gear because you've always been very loyal to your brands we talked about how you started off with pork pie drums yeah. and then you've made the switch to uh, the gretsch drum kit but we also want to hear because about the other types of equipment that you use. Cause you know, when I do the guitar players that get on the show, we go a little guitar geek gear heavy, but as drummers go, what do you got? Sticks, you got cymbals and you've got, um, I guess, in-ear monitors that you, that you ha need as far as the drums. So you got the Gretsch yeah. drum. What about sticks? Yeah. Uh, Vic Firth sticks. And I've been with them for, for years because of Mark Shulman, our producer, when we were recording, the dad's porno mag record. He was a Vic Firth artist. He told um, uh, Kelly Firth about me, uh, who's Vic Firth's daughter. She sent me, a, a, because there was no email back then. That's how, how old we were um, or are. It and, was uh, AOL, but it took too long to sign on. It was AOL. And remember, they had a modem yeah. and go, yeah. Yeah. So, because of Mark. Mark Shulman saying, hey, I'm producing this band, Dad's Pornomag, and, and Mike Pisano is, is my friend, and he's a, he's a great drummer, and he loves the product. Uh, she sent me a contract, and I got signed, so I've been with them for years, from like 95 till now. Um, so Vic First Sticks, they make the best drum sticks. Um, I play Zildjian cymbals. I've, played, I've had help from Zildjian for over 20 years because of my relationship with Matt Sorum, and in 2015, I just signed a contract. And the great legendary Hal Blaine from the Wrecking Crew, I have a picture with him and my contract because I was doing something for him with one of my drum sets one day. And um, so Zildjian Cymbals, uh, Remo Drumheads, I've been with Remo forever, um, and they're great. Um, it's, it's crazy. Uh, and then Ultimate Ear um, in-ear monitors, and, and they're great. And, and that, that just kind of isolates uh, the sound and saves my ears every night. But um, but yeah, those are my companies. But I was I was with Pork Pie for a long time, and my friend Bill makes great drums. And it was just it was a time after 27 years for our band and the style of music and the look of the gear and the stuff. It was time to move um, move companies, and I moved to Gretsch Drums, and I'm I'm really happy to be a part of their family. And uh, well, classic. And if you look right in there, I can see Matt Sorms there. I can see Mark yeah. Shulman. There's a lot of cast of characters right, right there. And there's Mike Fasano not leaning his head in. Niels Lozauer obviously didn't do this photo shoot because Mike, your, your uh, head looks normal. Your neck doesn't look extended. Do you, you want to know <laughs> something funny? I'm better at photo shoots now, even though I absolutely hate them. So when you guys were asking me for photos and Vic was asking me for photos and I was giving just photos I found off a line, I don't do photo shoots for myself. I did one for Gretsch for the endorsement and that was it. And then I do the Tiger Army ones because they do it. But I would never, I'm the, I don't want a photo of me. Uh, I have a photo shoot for me, but uh, you know what so I grabbed kind of some funny. of the photos, some of the old photos that I grabbed off of Dad's porno mag we came exclusively from MySpace. I actually went yeah. on MySpace last night because we had a hell of a MySpace uh, page, didn't we? And uh, this is a little wow. bit of a carryover from last week's Orianthi podcast, folks, because we were, were we're just trying to maybe bring back MySpace as long along with the uh, In the Trenches podcast. But we are here with Mike Fasano. There it is. Maybe they should be our sponsor. What do you think about that, Vic? Huh? Sounds, Does that sound good? Great. It's time for Never Let the Truth Get in the Way of a Good Story. That's in one line. Vic, do you have a segue for that now, too, so I don't get scared? 
Should no. I turn my earphones down? Because that last know. bumper was loud. Was little... Now he's got nothing. You got nothing for that? All right. Well, anyway. Oh. <laughs> Never let the truth get in the way story of a good story. It's a uh, segment that we started because Alice Cooper does like to embellish the truth sometimes. And we want to get to the bottom of dispelling rumors, myths, or controversies. Okay. So our first myth is, or maybe just a question, is uh, you can catch more social diseases, you can get socially transmitted diseases from either A, playing drums in warrant, or B, being on the cruise ship lines back in the 80s. That's great. Um, if I knew what I knew now, back when I was 19 on the cruise ships, I'd probably have a lot of diseases. <laughs> But I was such a, a sweet young kid out there. I will tell you one funny story. One of our ships, the Crown Princess, was the inaugural sailing in 1991. And we, every port we went to, from Italy all the way across the Atlantic to New York, we had this inaugural where they break the, um, the, the champagne bottle on it. It was this inaugural sailing. And I remember we had the Prince of Monaco on. And, and, uh, and, and I guess that's the son of Grace Kelly, who, who had passed away, he was on. But the daughter, I, I don't know what her name was. The daughter saw the doctor on the ship because she had crabs. And then like two weeks later, she must have slept with one of the, the, the um, captain's uh, men uh, uh, on the ship. Yeah. Uh, and crabs went around the ship because Whoa. of the princess daughter of Monaco or whatever. So anyway, so I'd say it wasn't a special then, in the lobster tail. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> one it was of crazy. <laughs> so that was pretty weird. Pretty weird. Oh boy! All right. Well, that's a good one. So now you just added the royal family. That's good for us. That's a, that's our exclusive. That's our soundbite. <laughs> hashtag, hashtag royal royal fam, family. <laughs> so now, never let the truth get in the way of a good story. Have you or have you not had a gun pulled on you by famed producer Phil Spector? When you were doing an actual studio, uh, you did work for Phil Spector, am I right? Yes. So yes. Did, was a gun pulled or was there any sort of violence that happened in the studio? And what is your experience with Phil Spector? Yes, there was a gun. Whoa! Pulled. Fact? There was the fact. Uh, there was a first, gun. Of all, first of all, I, I, one of, I love the word fact because um, I don't, on a side note, is um, a lot of people talk shit. I talk fact. Um, so for, for whatever that's worth, always talk fact. I'm never jealous of anybody, but if somebody's an asshole, I'm going to talk fact about them, of my experiences with them. So anyway, yes, I, I, uh, was working with Matt Sorum on a Celine Dion record that Phil Spector was, um, oh, I love it. Mark hands eyes. And the first thing I've read today, that's great. You're quick, Mark. You're quick. Mark is quick. Um, Mark is quick. Um, uh, so, um, uh, we were working on this thing uh, for Celine Dion and Phil Spector was pr producing. Phil Spector does this thing, the wall of sound where he has, you know, two drummers and um, horn players. He invented it's it. Like, he invented like the wall of sound, right? 20, 20, um, you know, or 30 musicians. We were doing an overdub with Matt Sorum and um, it was basically the Guns N' Roses, November rain fill. That doom, do, do, do. Every four bars. That doom, do, do, do. So we did that. We got it done in a couple of passes. We went into the room and what's crazy about Phil Spector is people would come to watch him record. This is like 1.30, two, two in the morning now. So um, it's not a day job at this point. It's past. No, it's day back job. up and call at like 11 o'clock. Hey, could you bring drums down and we're going to do this thing. So to, to make a long story short is uh, there's something called uh, quarter inch tape um, loop do, doing a reverb. So he was on the, uh, he was, he was in there and they were doing this playback of duh, doo, 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 and he kept turning his head going, quit fucking with me, quit fucking with me, slow the tape down, slow the tape down to the engineer, just yelling at him, people looking at him, quit fucking with me, quit fucking with me, I want to pull my gun out and shoot you, you know, so I'm like, okay, whatever, crazy. Fast forward to, to nine in the morning because they had this, this chaotic thing, this is a whole, we can do a whole show on this. We're eating. Uh, 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 Roscoe's chicken and waffles because it's right by nine Ocean in the morning. I, how could you be eating yeah. at nine in the morning? Because this I mean, session started at nine o'clock and nobody had eaten. It's an all night thing. That's how he rolled, right? Yeah, so, but all night you're not eating at night. 
<laughs> that, that, that no, we're eating something breakfast, you're kind of like and walk. grinding teeth so, at 9 a.m. Well, that's the crazy thing, right? So he, we're, we're eating. He eventually stumbles in this little skinny, frail guy, Phil Spector, who I had no idea who the hell he was. I just knew he was a big, heavy producer. Like I said, I knew nothing. I just knew how to tune drums and set up drums and play drums and music. That's all I knew. And I was always in situations with Matt Sorum. It was always a situation with somebody. And I didn't care who they were because I had to take care of what I had to take care of. Anyway, we're all eating. Everybody's zombies. I managed to sleep for a couple hours because it was getting chaotic underneath the piano by the drums if they wanted to do more stuff. I said, let's order breakfast. We order breakfast for everybody. Chicken and waffles. Everybody's eating. Everybody's a zombie. I'm fresh, and I had to eat my thing. Phil stumbles in. He starts eating the chicken, and then this thing is like, ah, 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 this thing. And, and, and stuff started coming out, like drool, ah, ah. And I, and I look up, and everybody's eating, and I was just looking at him. I was like, is he choking on a chicken bone? He's got to be choking on a chicken bone. I get behind him. I, I get this little frag, feral guy with the fucking uh, toupee hair. And I grab him and I just do the Heimlich like I've seen the TV. I wasn't him? trained. Yes, I Heimlich him. I never the thing knew that came you out. Heimlicked I, I Heimlich him. Spectre. I Heimlich him. And um, he, he, uh, he turned around and reaching and he pulled his gun out. He turned to me and he said, ah, I was going to shoot you, but you saved my life. And Holy that was it. Now, now never I'm heard that Spectre. story. Now I'm Phil Spector's friend. He, this is what's kooky. We go at like six o'clock to um, El Compadre across from Guitar Center to have dinner because the session's over now. He takes Matt Sorum in his, um, his um, Rolls Royce, like John Lennon style, with the driver in the suit with the hat. I take Sorum's Porsche. We arrive there. Who is there? It's, it's, um, it's uh, Mark Furman from the OJ trial. Kato Kalin, a couple of bimbos there at this table. I'm sitting at a table eating. It's the kookiest thing. He's introducing me to Mark, uh, Mark Fer Furman to get me a carry and conceal license to carry a gun because I've <laughs> saved his life now. And this is kooky. And I'm just like, Matt, I got to get, I got to get out of here, man. This has been, this is going to be like 24 hours now. He goes, I go, look, I'm going to just take your car home, you know, get home. I'll bring your car here. Whatever. It was crazy. It's a crazy. I'm just, I'm just skimming the surface of this story, but it right. was How about absolutely this, nuts. We will have a whole nother episode at some later point where we just break down the Phil Spector. The uh, game film. Yeah. Yeah. We'll just break down the whole thing. Speaking of game film, I right. Disney Raiders Wait. are coming up and I'm, I'm, I'm all, I'm all ready for it right now. We've really been hanging quick. out with Mike Rosano. Wait, oh, hold on. He has some sort of new really? segment coming up. No, this? no, 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 no. Sorry. Really quick. Just cause we're on this story. Phil was so eccentric and whatever. He signed his check. Like, you know, normally there's a little line where you get paid and, and they sign, you sign on that little line. This is the yep. check, a copy of the check from the section. <laughs> Look at his signature. Holy shit. <laughs> Crazy. He has a small dick. Hashtag, I mean, big signature, small dick. It has to be, man. I don't know. That, there you go. Oh, my God. So you so, kept so it. Here's, here's the crazy thing. When, when that girl got killed in his, in his, in his penthouse, oh. I thought to myself, oh, my God, of course. He pulled yeah. the gun out. The gun went off. Not that he intentionally killed it, but the gun went off. And um, I thought myself crazy, but this was, you know, 15 years. Maybe she was that. doing I more. Think. Maybe she was giving him more than just the Heimlich. I don't know. Yeah. You know, yeah. never know. So, so anyway, so whatever. crazy anyway. Shit. Well, okay. Well that, that was our fucking game changer. I had no idea about that whole story. I'm glad that you finally told the whole thing because I think the last time maybe we started to talk of that story, it was probably a, one of, you know, Matt Swarm's parties where neither of us could actually talk. So I'm glad we were able to, <laughs> Don't get fetal. <laughs> Hold on. So, so there is an outcry for another part two. Of course, Mike, your family. He's a family. He's a Mike Fasano. He's going to come back at one point, folks. Uh, we we love him. Thank you so much for hanging out um, during all this time. We have one last sort of a uh, segment where you get to hype up all your social media and tell people basically, again, just a little recap of what they should check out. 
perhaps what they've learned all in what is on your social media, because there are some people that are watching on uh, or listening on the uh, Apple and Spotify platforms. Can you just go through your uh, social media and tell people if they want to find out more about Mike Visano, how they would do that? Um, basically, it's just it's all at Mike Visano. At one time, I had a, a Wikipedia, too, and there was Mike Fasano, the drummer, and then Mike Fasano, the Florida uh, politician. And, uh, and there's now also there's, a, a football player, too. Uh, it's, it's Anthony Fasano, the football okay. player. And then there was a baseball catcher named Sal Fasano. Obviously, okay. no relations. I'd love to meet these guys sometime. But everything's on there. Um, obviously, um, there's nothing really happening right now uh, with Tiger Army just because of COVID. And we don't, can't book anything because we don't know when we're going to be able to play. Um, Nick 13 did a really cool thing yesterday. He did the Gretsch guitar, uh, Instagram takeover. I encourage everybody to check that out. Um, everything you want to know about tiger army. If you don't see it from me on uh, my thing is it, tigerarmy.com. Um, um, I want to give a shout out to, um, to, uh, all of your fans, your staff. This was the craziest thing doing this show. First of all, when, when I said, Oh, let's do the show. I thought it was going to be like a month from now. And then, Five days ago, there's the blitzkrieg of yep. promotion from Can I, all of can these we, wonderful uh, people. Can we have yes. a, and the Voice It Show, Mike Usenek even helped out. So yeah. many people uh, helped in the promotion of the show. Of course, all of Team RGA, uh, yeah. whether it's Dave and Scotty and Robbie, I know they're they're in the chat right now. And of course, our trusted producer, Vic Chalfont, who's just throwing out introductions and animations when I'm not sure they're going to come or they are going to come, but he's laughing his ass off. I'd like to get Mike. Uh, you know what, Vic? Will you come oh. on just for a quick second, just to show people the your your, your Tiger Army pride, even though it's not any uh, Tiger Army it's, official it's merch? It's not totally official. Phony. It's, it's not even a tiger You shirt. know what? It's he's not even bootleg. <laughs> it's not even bootleg. But he's really looking at him. He really goes for the effort. If you ever notice, yeah, folks, I'm going to bring it. on. I'm going to bring Vic on just even for a moment. Now that's enough, Vic. You have to go away. <laughs> <laughs> but that was Vic Chalfont, our producer, who always dresses up for the occasion. Mike Fasano, you dressed up for the occasion. If you want to check out more of Mike, of course, Instagram at Mike Fasano, uh, Facebook at Mike Fasano, Twitter at Mike Fasano, and of course, TigerArmy.com. Um, Mike, I'm going to leave you. Oh, there he is. He is the cat Sorry. dad. He's been saying it all day. Which one is that? This is Sleeve the Cat. Look it. It's like a tattoo sleeve. The one on the one with the with the pattern. Listen, I had so many people hit me up asking about sleeve. Everybody loves sleeve. This is Sleeve the Cat. He's about twenty aka pig, because he's twenty one pounds. And every time he walks by a uh, food bowl, he eats like like, oh that food bowl's not gonna be there be there. Higher, higher, can you go higher, back to that photo, uh, Vic? Can you go back to that photo of Mike Fasano and Warrant? Because I think actually it was like that's like that shot that you were doing. You're putting out the uh, hand for the. There it is. Is that the one with the sleeve? No, no the one not. where you, the other one, the other one where you land. Uh, oh yeah, out the, the sleeve. sleeve. Yeah, right there. <laughs> the there <sleeve>. it is. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> loved having you on, Mike Fasano. Hey, it was uh, a great time. It was, it was, it was fun. Well, hey, man, we will do it again. The uh, public outcry for you to uh, be on again is there. And, of course, we're going to break down that uh, that Phil Spector saga play by play. And um, who knows? Maybe we can get Phil uh, Spector from somewhere. I don't know. Does prison from have prison. good Wi-Fi? Yeah, I think, yeah, I think so. Probably has better Wi-Fi than us, man. Well, you've you been know, listening there, to – There's a photo somewhere. I don't have it. It's on. It's, I, I'll send it to you for next time of us and that kooky group – for the next show, it's it's incredible with Cato and all these people. Yeah. Ra, Ra, we didn't even uh, talk uh, about our trip to we didn't talk about our trip to New York together with DPM because that yeah. was a, a show and a circus unto its own. And uh, we've actually had a really good time. I I'm impressed that I was able to go through all of your musical bands and able to sort of pepper in the the business of music as well yeah. because you've been able to uh sort of jump back and forth from both fields but at the end of the day it's work ethic it's the way it's, it's the way that you conduct yourself in the studio so that it's actually has helped you with gigs and the way you conduct yourself on stage because that actually has gotten you studio gigs so it all kind of works together right yeah totally well, um, hey, Mike, have a great one. Um, thanks thanks again, Mike Fasano, for being everybody. Say uh, 
Cheers to him. Uh, thank you for following uh, In the Trenches podcast. Uh, my name is Ryan Roxy. Until next time, enjoy the ride. See you.